Hello, my name is Eliza Roberts and I lead Microsoft's Enterprise Water Positive by 2030 Agenda. And I'm really excited to host this IdeaGen session about SDG 6 with my colleague, Katie Ross. Hi everyone, Katie Ross. I lead sustainability for Microsoft's real estate and thrilled to show the sort of two-sided um, component of Microsoft's approach to being water positive by 2030. Great. So I've spent the majority of my career working on water challenges. The SDGs have played a critical role in driving action on key global challenges for people and the planet by 2030. And I'm really excited to share more with you today about how Microsoft is helping to make progress against SDG 6. So for this session, I'll start by providing you all with an overview of what Microsoft's water positive commitment is. And then I'll pass it to Katie, who will provide a deep dive about what our commitment looks like in action. So Microsoft is committed to harnessing the power of technology to help everyone everywhere build a more sustainable future. In 2020, we made a bold commitment and detailed plan to become carbon negative by 2030, zero waste by 2030, water positive by 2030, and to protect more land than we use and to build a planetary computer. So I'm gonna start a little bit dire here, but I promise to end on a more positive note. So water challenges are going to become more extreme. We know that one of the first ways we will feel the effects of climate change is through water. And it's important to remember before I dive in here that when we're talking about water, we're not just talking about water scarcity or whether there's too little water. There are also places where there's too much water and other places where it's too dirty or polluted. Um, and so too little, too much, too polluted. And that helps make the water challenges that we're grappling with much more complex and challenging on a day-to-day -day basis. Many of you have probably heard this stat that the world is expected to face a 56% deficit in freshwater supply by 2030, according to the World Resources Institute. Today, one in four people live in countries facing extreme water stress, according to the UN, and that's expected to increase to one in two people uh, in 2030 and beyond. Today, there are about 2 billion people across the globe, or 25% of the world's population, who lack safely managed drinking water services. The costs that we need to improve global water infrastructure globally are staggering. There's a range of different numbers, but they're in the trillions, and they're really expected to, to rise in time. And to put this in perspective, if you look at the US alone, each day, 6 billion gallons of water are lost to aging leaking pipes. That's roughly 14% of our daily consumption. So we know we have a challenge, we know it's increasing. We know we all depend on water to survive. And thus there's a really important role for all of us, particularly companies to play in protecting freshwater resources for future generations. So that's why at Microsoft, we co-founded the Water Resilience Coalition, which I'll refer to as the WRC. And that's a CEO-led initiative that's a part of the UN Global Compact with a goal to reduce water stress by 2050. So we joined the Water Resilience Coalition in 2050. We're still an active member. And then as a part of that, we also set a commitment to be water positive by 2030. So water positive uh, is a new, a new term it still requires more clarity and guidance in the space, and we're helping to develop that. Um, in the meantime, I want to share a bit about what water positive means to Microsoft. So in Microsoft, water positive means we will reduce our water use intensity across our operations, so the, the water we use per megawatt of energy used for our operations. We will replenish water in water-stressed regions where we work, more than we consume by 2030. We will provide 1.5 million people with access to clean water and sanitation services and will drive innovation and digitization of water and engage in water policy. For today, in the interest of time, I'm gonna focus mostly on the first three. So water reduction, I'll give a high level here and then Katie's gonna dive in a lot more. Um, but with, within the water reduction piece, as I noted, we're working to reduce the water intensity of our global operations. We're doing this through investment in efficiency, recycling and reuse, and investment in innovations at data centers and campuses across the globe. So we're working to design buildings and data centers to be as efficient as possible. We're tracking the water we use to minimize leaks. We're reusing every drop of water as many times as we can before we discharge it to local municipalities. We're procuring reclaimed water from utilities where it's available, we're rainwater harvesting. On the innovation side, we're using air instead of water to cool data centers. And we're piloting increasing the temperature set point at evaporative cooled data centers to ensure that we're using air to cool data centers instead of water for more days of the year. We're the first technology company to pilot liquid immersion cooling at data centers. We're piloting air to water generation and building rainwater harvesting structures on our buildings and data centers. 
I'll leave it to Katie to talk about this one more. And now I'm going to dive into replenishment. So replenishment is something that a lot of people get confused about. So I'll start with our target and then explain a little bit what it means. So we are committed to replenishing more water in high stress regions that we consume globally. Replenishment ultimately means that we return a volume of water to the local catchment where it came from. So through this target, we're planning to return more water than we use across our global operations in the high stress basins where we operate. We've got roughly 40 priority locations across the globe that are particularly high stress where we plan to focus these replenishment investments. I'm not going to share specific projects at this time in the interest of time. If you're curious to learn more, I would encourage you to check out our sustainability report from last year and other information that we have online. Um, but I'll share a little bit about our progress um, and the different types of replenishment projects that we invest in across the globe. So you can invest in projects like rainwater harvesting. You can procure, do land conservation projects where you procure a swath of land, keep it from being developed, and then the rain that falls on that land is recharged into the system. There are infrastructure projects. There are, I think I said watershed restoration projects. If you're curious to learn more about the different types of projects, you can check out the Volumetric Water Benefit Accounting Guidance, VWBA, that was put out by the World Resources Institute and Limnotech. And it provides different categories for the many different types of replenishment projects that companies can invest in, and information about how you quantify the volumetric benefits for each of those different types of replenishment projects. So our progress for replenishment thus far, as of FY21, we've replenished 45% of our FY21 consumption. This percentage is just going to keep increasing as we get closer to 2030. As of FY21, we invested in replenishment projects that are expected to generate roughly 1.3 million cubic meters of volumetric benefits. Today, we have about 27 replenishment projects in our portfolio in locations across the globe. And thus far, we've invested more than 7 million in replenishment projects, but we're really just getting started. On the accessibility side, again, our target is to provide 1.5 million people with access to water and sanitation services. We have a partnership with water.org that we've used to really kick off uh, our progress against this target. We're helping people in underserved communities gain lasting and reliable access to safe drinking water and improved sanitation solutions. The different types of solutions that the microfinance loans from water.org are providing to communities are things like household taps, toilets, piped connections, rainwater harvesting, water storage, purification. As of the end of FY22, we've reached roughly 550,000 people in Brazil, India, Indonesia, and Mexico, with about a third of those being children, um, and 100,000 or so of those are 100,000 different improvements that have reached 550,000 people. I'm not going to talk too much about the driving digitization, excuse me, and innovation and policy, but there is one thing I do want to share that I'm really excited about that, that we're doing at Microsoft. So Microsoft has a $1 billion climate innovation fund that we're using to accelerate the global development of climate-related solutions, including water. So through this fund, we're investing directly in companies, funds, and projects to support existing technologies that need capital to scale, and also investing in new and niche climate and water solutions. So what's next? And then I'll pass the ball to Katie. So we're continuing to make progress against our 2030 commitment. We're going to replenish more than we consume by 2030, enable access to drinking water and sanitation to people across the globe, and continue maximizing efficiency within our operations and investing in innovations. Really proud of the work that we've done thus far at Microsoft. And yet we recognize that there is so much more that needs to be done in this space. Water truly requires a collective approach. We can do everything possible to get to water positive. We will get to water positive. Um, and yet the water resources we depend on can still be depleted by others in those basins. So in addition to making progress against water positive, we're doing what we can to help accelerate corporate action on water by sharing our learnings, increasing membership of the Water Resilience Coalition. If you're curious to learn more and you're just starting your water journey, I would encourage you to check out the WRC member the website or, or reach out to me. We're also investing in partnerships, investing in water-related startups that are bringing innovative solutions to the table to help scale water solutions. And we're working with NGOs to scale and build the market for replenishment, which is still very much in its early days and quite nascent. We're two years in, we've got a lot to do and a lot to learn. We'll do our best to share those learnings, but also keep our eye on the prize, which is really doing our part to protect water resources for the future. So with that, I will pass the baton to my colleague, Katie, who will give you a taste of what reducing water use really looks like on the ground across our campuses and facilities. Thanks so much, Eliza. So 
Um, as I mentioned, we really think about our water positive approach um, and, and really most of our sustainability commitments as a, as a two pronged approach. We think about um, managing within our four walls, um, how we can reduce as much as possible within our operations and then focus on externally and replenishment a lot of the work that, um, that Eliza just highlighted for you. So within our real estate, just to give context of what our real estate looks like, we have a combination of owned and leased office buildings all around the world, totaling over 36 million square feet. Um, we have three pillars of our approach that really drive sustainability within our real estate and every decision that we make. The first is as we think about master planning, um, how do we do our ground up projects? How do we think differently about the infrastructure that we're investing in? The, th the second is focusing on operations, having water reduction strategies across our global portfolio. And the third is really engaging with our employees making sure they're part of the solution that will inevitably make help us meet our 2030 goals as well as um, identifying ways that they can improve their water usage not only within campus but also within their homes and their broader um, uh, experience and so um, to highlight a, a handful of initiatives within gws um, first of, as i think about master planning we have invested in a lot of work thinking about fit for purpose design um, and what that means is thinking about the ways in which we use the right quality water for the right use case not using drinking water for things like flushing toilets um, and ensuring that we are reusing water on campus as much as possible to minimize our demand uh, for potable water a few key examples of this lie in our sustainability standards, which we have across our global portfolio, which require things like low flow fixtures, but also thinking differently about landscaping on site and minimizing the use of things like decorative turf, um, which require a lot of water usage, um, and really focusing on where do we have the most impact of our water usage. We also uh, look at instilling a water balance approach, which I'll talk more about in our Silicon Valley campus in a few minutes. Um, but thinking about what is our total available water on site and how do we optimize reuse as much as possible so we're using, um, we're managing to our water budget in the same way that we manage to energy budgets and financial budgets. Um, that means in many of our water stress regions we are increasingly dual piping our real estate to ensure that we can use recycled water or rainwater for things like flush fixtures um, in our recently opened Herzliya campus we have um, captured all of the um, condensate water from our cooling towers to use it for irrigation and that's just one example of ways that we think differently about our water use on site and how we can capture as much of it as possible for reuse elsewhere. On the operation side, um, we have a key performance indicator across our full portfolio, ensuring that we have energy or water reduction projects in all of our 600 some odd sites, ensuring that water efficiency is top of mind across the board. Um, we also are investing in innovations in this space. A great example is our recent project in our Hyderabad campus, which are, uh, we've installed four new air to water generators, um, which were, are um, pulling the air uh, humidity from the air um, and using that for drinking water on site which will enable us to provide 20% of the campus's drinking water um, via this innovative approach, um, especially as we think about different ways to deploy technology in water stress regions. This was an exciting opportunity for us to not only reduce our demand on the local municipal system, but also utilize resources that um, were previously untapped for meeting our potable water demands. Our Silicon Valley campus is an excellent example of a way that we rethought our water, our approach to water usage um, across the board from the beginning. This campus was 
um, a redevelopment project. It is 600,000 square feet um, and will serve over 2,000 employees. And it will be our first net zero non-potable water campus. Um, so with that, we focused on reuse and establishing a water budget for the campus, identifying our total water demands on site, both potable and non-potable, and where we could ensure that we were recycling and reusing enough water to offset our non-potable water usage. Um, that played out in a number of different strategies. Probably the, um, the most unique for us was installing a, an on-site wastewater treatment plant, whereby we will take all of the um, gray and black water on-site and treat it for reuse, non-potable reuse on the campus, ensuring that the only water um, that we get from municipal sources is potable water and the remaining water usage um, is all generated on site. Um, this project is achieving um, PETL certification from the International Living Future Institute um, for water um, and will be our first net zero non-potable water certified campus. Um, the approach with this campus I think was also unique because we did take a water balance approach. Instead of um, we design a building and it uses as much water as it uses and then we identify efficiency opportunities along the way. In this um, project, we really sought to establish a, bu a budget from the beginning. And as we worked through design, we were managing to that budget. So if a landscaping team came in and proposed certain um, certain landscaping features, which would use more water than the budget was allocated, we would need to redesign that portion of the, the campus to ensure we all maintained the budget. And while that might seem not necessarily the most novel approach to water usage, it certainly changes the paradigm of how the design and construction industry historically has looked at water usage. And I think truly respects the incredible resource that is water and ensuring that we're using the right water and the right um, systems to optimize our water usage and reduce our demand um, on municipal systems and, and really, I think, from the third pillar in education, helping to educate our employees on the ways that water are used in our offices and in our homes that we maybe don't think of. Um, and so that educational um, component, it's such a critical element to how we deliver our real estate. So these are just a handful of examples of how we think about water differently within our real estate. Um, and really, it's a call to action and a challenge to all in um, the working in the built environment and running operations to, to think differently on approaches to water usage, increase water recycling as much as possible, and seek out um, unique uh, innovations in water um, generation like the air to water systems or other approaches to development that buck the business as usual trend um, and ensure that we uh, meet our water positive commitments by 2030.